Thank you, Ron Tompkins, for coming to have an interview here today. Um, I recall actually the first time that I met you uh, in 2017, I think it was at the uh, Stanford Symposium at Ron's house after, after the symposium or the community day, I think. And uh, you weren't working on MECFS much at the time. I mean, I knew, uh, I knew you were someone who had done a lot of research in a lot of different fields, um, specifically around uh, stra oh, trauma. But I, re I really remember that you had a really great understanding of MECFS from my perspective and the perspective of people I've collaborated with, um, I'd been working on MECFS for seven years. Um, collaborators have been working on it for decades. And yeah, I was really impressed by that um, effectively. And so I guess digging into more of the work that you've done and more of the history of the work that you've done and kind of get a better understanding of how you kind of came to that kind of understanding in regards to MECFS. I'm speaking, I guess, a lot about the Glue Grant, um, which I find a really fascinating project as one of the major things that you've, you've accomplished in your career. Um, and now we're in a pandemic three years, four years later, three years later, and uh, it's becoming all too more relevant again. Um, so I thought I might start with that, um, chat a little bit about, you know, your work in the Glue Grant and how it may be relevant to this COVID 2ME project that we're doing collaboratively here. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, I recall our first meeting and uh, uh, I, I was very impressed with a young man that was very interested in metabolism and uh, a deep understanding about this, this particular problem. And I'm delighted that you've chosen to spend quite a bit of your career here trying to understand this problem. With Ron Davis, over the last few decades, we have explored a great deal in the whole field of injury research. And um, the Glue Grant was a $100 million project funded by the NIH to better understand from a, what's called genomic or gene expression perspective, as well as from protein changes, as well as uh, metabolic features that occur when one is injured seriously enough to die. Um, and the patients we studied had a 20% mortality rate. So it's very important to understand how the human system responds when you have a one chance in five of dying. It's about as severe a stress as is possible. Um, but in doing so, we had over 100 principal investigators and over 10 years to begin to understand and collect information in a very systematic way to, to how the human system responds in circumstances like that. I, I was very delighted that just us just getting together, we improved the survival rate by 50% wow. in major blunt trauma. And over the last few decades, our, our interest in the field of burns, we've almost eliminated the mortality in pediatric and children who are severely burned. Uh, the expectation is to survive. So I am very excited about the fact that if one takes science and really begins to apply it to clinical medicine, you can make a huge difference. Uh, my relationship with Ron Davis Who's, who's gradually over time had to be interested in MECFS because of his son, um, has continued, he continually asked me about things uh, as a doctor, for part of me as a scientist and part as a doctor, and uh, I would just simply answer his questions. And both of us came to the realization that much of what we were learning in the area of injury it was extremely applicable uh, to this disease in ECFS. And so I'm, I've become more engaged to use that information that we gained um, after a tremendous um, experience in, in better understanding ME and how it occurs and the inability to understand its its etiology, I hate to use that word, but reason 
that it exists and why doesn't it resolve normally? I think that's the, um, and I guess I'd sum, summarize, uh, summarize that as uh, looking at kind of that transition from the acute to a, a chronic disease state um, and how that triggering component kind of interacts. Uh, and that obviously is super relevant to this COVID-19 research that we're looking into. Um, but also it's probably interesting enough to, 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 to talk about how uh, the common pathways, I guess, the body kind of goes through or the stress pathways that it goes through uh, in response to all varieties of different types of stresses. Obviously, you're talking about trauma or blood trauma or burns in this, in this case for the blue grant, but then you have infection and all these other ones. So what is, I mean, do we know that there is a common kind of path um, that is taken? Well, way? let's just, let's just think about it, Chris. Um, it, it's only been the last four or five decades, if you were incredibly ill, sick, uh, that you would even survive. And that has purely been the result of our understanding of how to deal with critical care medicine. In the past, over our entire history, um, if you were incredibly sick, let's say you fell off a cliff and broke bones, you crawl back into the cave, you know, your family brought you some, maybe some twigs, leaves and water, but you either survived or didn't. And uh, it, it really was rather local injuries that actually allowed you to survive. If there were any terrible infection or terrible injury, you were left behind and uh, eaten. And uh, there was no, I'm just looking, speaking from an from a evolutionary perspective, there was no advantage um, that uh, genetics could provide that will allow you to survive. It's only been in the last 50 years that if you got that sick, you were going to be able to survive. So to come up with an evolutionary argument why I, I would respond differently to a terrible infection as opposed to a terrible injury is, is, is hard to make because you would have simply died and that you would not have lived long enough to reproduce. There is no evolutionary pressure that would, that would come up and say, as a human, you know, I'm, I have a special response to infection. Yeah. It's just you, you would have simply had died. So, um, it is reasonable that any serious stress and the recovery from it is rather common. More than different. I, I don't understand how you would have distinctions. So that, I guess that's very relevant for the rationale we took for the uh, looking into the COVID-19 to ME uh, and looking using this kind of uh, opportunity, I would say. And I guess it is a massive opportunity, not just because of, of the global interest, but also that you have the ability to identify um, people going through an infection uh, right at the beginning of an infection, uh, where usually there isn't as much attention paid to that occurring. And these people are popping up in the ICUs and hospitals. Um, so I guess we can talk about that project and uh, maybe give an update on how that's going. Um, it, this is uh, the SARS um, coronavirus 2 is a very, what we would call pro-inflammatory virus, such that um, its infection creates a tremendous inflammatory reaction. And um, it will, it can, uh, in some individuals is pretty minor, but uh, at least in the acute disease, and by acute disease, I mean over first 24 hours. What we're observing, however, is those who do survive, uh, those who have been hospitalized, that uh, if they're lucky enough to be discharged, that uh, over the next four to six months, uh, they're having persistent uh, symptoms, uh, very often pulmonary, but also other uh, symptoms. And uh, we're also seeing a second group of individuals whose original illness wasn't terrible enough for them to be hospitalized, 
But yet after four to six weeks, their symptoms not only don't resolve, but evolve and might even be worsening. So we're, we're seeing this entire very significant population who over the next six months after the original illness um, have persistent and evolving symptoms. And uh, the NIH has described that as post-acute uh, <clears throat> coronavirus sequelae, PACS, PACS. It's, it's really the same as long COVID, in which you just fail to recover from this horrendous stress. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it's not just restricted to those who had a severe illness. Um, there are some whose illness was not that severe, and yet they are continuing to suffer, and if not even persist and get worse. And so I, I do think this is an opportunity to better understand what loosely has been termed post-infectious fatiguing illnesses, of which, in my opinion, ME is, uh, ME-CFS is, is one of those. So it, because this is inf affecting millions and uh, to the point where the, uh, at least the United States government is so concerned about it, they invested $1.15 billion um, in order to understand better uh, so that in the future, we're not going to be surprised. So we, we have this 1.15 billion to better understand how this disease process evolves. And in my opinion, um, some of the uh, symptoms of individuals over six to 12 months will simply be persistent damage to organs like their lungs or um, in the central nervous system or cardiac or other areas. And you can do normal blood tests or images and identify persistent organ damage. But at some point, um, those studies are going to become normal or not abnormal, and, and yet the symptoms are still present, which is very much what patients with ME-CFS face every day. They have very significant symptoms, yet the standard tests don't show abnormalities. And I think this is going to be a fabulous opportunity to be able to watch this pr process happen. And at 12 to 24 months, where you have blood tests and x-rays and all sorts of images, and there's no organ damage to blame, yet the patients are still suffering from this, uh, I hate to even use the word fatigue, but it is, a, it is an energy problem that if they exceed their, their threshold, they will pay a huge price. And, uh, and it's difficulty focusing, their dysautonomic symptoms. And I think it's so, it, it is, I hate, I, I hate that it had to occur because of a pandemic, but I think it's going to be such a big issue that we're going to learn something from this. Yeah, I would, I would, I would certainly say so. And I, I guess the, the study design we've gone for and the reason why we're so interested in um, the ICU patients or hospitalized cases, if we can get to them or even the non, is to get to them at the point when they've had this infection. And I believe that was to do with some of the work that you've done on that, on that glue grant in the past, looking at trauma and identifying that uh, some of the, the clinical trajectories, the different clinical trajectories from trauma uh, over time and, and the length of duration of, of uh, recovery, some of those markers were, were kind of established very early on in the infection phase or the acute phase. Is that, is that correct? And um, is that kind of where we're at as well with the study? We're looking at um, the first uh, the first week or the first week of infection effectively to look for these markers and then following them on to see 
what they may link to in terms of clinical recovery? The aspect of the glue, there are multiple aspects of the glue grant that are very relevant. Um, uh, you can appreciate if you were hit by a bus that you end up in the intensive care unit. Uh, you also ended up probably in a lot of operations, but um, we do know a tremendous, we did learn a tremendous amount about how one, the, how the white blood cells respond um, over time. And um, I can tell you that 80% of all the human genes respond in a maximum uh, response over the, actually within the first day or so after the injury. So we've, we've called that a genomic storm because every single gene that could have responded, all human genes, 80% of them did respond in your circulating blood. Uh, similarly, in each of our tissues, and the, the, t the other tissues that we studied are ones that we could biopsy, and that was um, muscle and skin and fat. Because we were doing operations, we could look at individual tissues. Uh, but we used that as a reflection of how what probably happens in all of our organ systems. And each of those had a very similar dramatic response. So we know a lot about how genes respond. And as a result of the genes, we also understand um, in separate studies about proteins, and we have for many years known quite a bit about how small molecules, how the molecular metabolic response occurs. And there is a very consistent coordination among all of those systems that occurs after injury. And it is our hypothesis or a thought that these are going to be very similar after very serious uh, viral infections. And it, to, the, to a major degree, um, what we've observed in patients who've had a very serious COVID infection, it's a very inflammatory response. They're describing it as a cytokine storm these are all things that we routinely see after injury. And I, it is our expectation that the genetics or genomic response is going to be comparable. Now, what happens then is you have, you have patients who recover normally or rapidly, relatively rapidly. Uh, you can imagine being hit by a bus and you're not gonna just jump out of bed, but it may take you a few months, but you will ultimately be normal. Uh, be healthy, but it may take a few months, but that would be the very best human recovery possible. You can also imagine that there are individuals in which it's going to take them more than six months, but they will eventually be normal. And you would call that something like a delayed recovery but a recovery nonetheless. And there are going to be individuals who not only are delayed, but never actually return to normal. So there are, so there is what we call an uncomplicated recovery. You were hit by a bus, but you did recover. And then there's complicated, but recovery. And then there's complicated and you never actually make it all the way back. So okay. those are basically three different types of recoveries. And there, you can associate those with genetics and with uh, proteomics and with uh, metabolomics. And it, it really might be useful in two ways. One, if you could use them for prediction and you could very early identify those who are going to have problems so that you might treat them differently than others. 
Um, and number two, you can take advantages of those differences and it's possible they can become targets for treatments so that it's potentially those, uh, those targets could be used as therapeutic targets to improve. So those are the major motivations to take what we know with injury and maybe apply some of those concepts in this possibility of development of, of ME after this terrible infection. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really fascinating and I think a great rationale for the reasons for doing this study. Um, I kind of want to go over a few of these other projects that you're, you've been up, up sure. doing. I mean, I think the, one of the more fascinating ones for me and probably one of urgent need is the PASCAP program. Um, maybe you could do a little brief introduction of that and uh, we can talk a little bit more about that. The PASCAD is, uh, and let me try to remember what PASCAD stands for. Uh, it, it's a patient uh, assessment of symptom uh, system so that um, it's a computerized ability for patients to take their time that would character, uh, very carefully characterize whether they have what I would call a sentinel symptom that the doctor should be aware of. And so let's talk about a couple of symptoms of ME that are very characteristic of ME that if present, the doctor should stop, listen, and pay attention to. And I think one of those is um, post-exertional malaise. And I, I mentioned it a little bit, but with, with expenditure of in energy, patients know they're going to pay a price for it. Number one, they have a threshold. And if they remain below that threshold, they can survive reasonably. But if they cross that threshold, they're going to pay a tremendous price for it. I know this is loosely termed as fatigue, but this is a very more specific form of fatigue. And it's not something that doctors are traditionally aware of or pay attention to at all. I call it a sentinel symptom. And if, if that type of symptomatology um, exists, the doctor should stop, look, and listen and do something about it. So, I don't know what the problem is, and uh, but it is a symptom that should be, it's not in your head, it's not psychosomatic, you're not depressed, it's real. And so um, what a pass, uh, uh, the other part of it is CAD, and CAD is computerized adaptive testing. And what it has to do is, um, it's been used in testing uh, methodologies all over, if you do certification exams and all sorts of computer testing, um, it is an ability to take a, a database of questions, ask you a few questions, and if you're competent in areas, move on to other questions. And uh, in a very precise and, and uh, prompt way, identify your level of competence in many different domains for certification. And uh, it's, for example, in, in this context, if you don't have headaches, don't ask me a page of questions about headaches. And, uh, but if I'm having pain, let's get to the point of what kind of pain I have. And, and uh, computers can decide um, and, uh, to understand and come up with questions much like your doctor would. If he, were, he or she were sitting across from you, they won't ask you a million questions about headache if you don't have headaches. Yep. But they will, they will take your symptoms until they're comfortable that they know what kind of pain you might have. And uh, there's a computerized way of doing exactly that. And it will allow patients to come up with their set of symptoms and a report for their clinician. And uh, the way we're looking at it is we would like a uh, sensitivity of 95%, which means if you have one of these symptoms, we're going to do our best to uh, not miss you. 
there's less than 5% chance of missing you, but it'll be about an 80%, if indeed you have one of these symptoms, there would be about an 80% likelihood that indeed you have the symptom that we're looking for, like post-exertional malaise. And, uh, and it would tell the clinician, <clears throat> you, have a, you have a very important symptom, it needs to be evaluated, it might be simple, and, and we have suggestions about evaluation and treatments, or it might be that 20% where you really need to see a specialist. But this is really aimed at the primary care physician. Number one, it tells them this is not psychosomatic. You're not depressed. There's something real here. These are things you need to do to evaluate it. And these are the indications uh, for referral to a specialist and what kind of specialist. And these are some suggested treatments. And in the long run, we can use them as quantitative metrics for intervention studies. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I really like the, your description in terms of um, like asking you a lot of questions regarding headaches when you don't have headaches. But I, and I, and I think it's interesting because rather than having a hundred questions and surveys about all the different types of symptoms they may have in all different ways, um, effectively what you're trying to do is get to one symptom and then deeply characterize that, that one symptom. Even the idea of fatigue just being one way of saying, oh, I have fatigue, rather than kind of getting to a better understanding of the specific aspects of it, which is like the qualitative, I mean, everyone has their own experience, but it's probably unique, but we kind of, we might term it all a very similar thing. So I think that's fascinating, that, you know, this program and the way that it operates, um, you do, uh, the computerized adaptive testing is a very clever way of trying to get deeper information um, than we're currently getting on patient symptoms. Um, NECFS is such, if you look at it, it has such a dynamic range. Uh, you, at the one end, you could be bed bound. Uh, uh, a less severe, you can be home bound, but, and, but you can't work. Or you can be home bound and be able to work or you can barely be functional at work, but can't, you have no other life. Yeah. I mean, it has a dynamic range that is unbelievable. So this is, I mean, this is kind of, the, this is where we need to get to. Uh, and the diagnosis components of, uh, for research, not just for the patients, but for research has been a complication, I guess, because of that dynamic range, but also the variation in which people get diagnosed and, uh, and all sorts of things. So this would really help I think in many different capacities. So I'm looking forward to that program or that this, uh, this past cat being uh, uh, ready for, uh, for use. Uh, I also want to kind of touch over some of the work that you're doing um, in the imaging sphere, the neurological neuroinflammation sphere. Um, did you want to kind of go over some of that work just briefly now? My interest in the neuroinflammation it has been longstanding with colleagues and, and, um, neurosciences and in uh, uh, nuclear medicine here over the last three or four decades. Uh, and uh, it, a part of it was related to understanding dementias, but what has become abundantly clear over the last 10 years is that the role of inflammation, neuroinflammation, cells impact on astrocytes and um, it's what occurs within neuronal um, reduction in, in synaptic connections, apoptosis. I know these are all very technical terms, but um, it is so critical to the understanding of how the brain works. And uh, our, we've gathered so many wonderful tools along those lines, and there's so many people here at our hospital very much involved in that. So I, and as, I, as I look at ME, ME-CFS, this, uh, this issue of uh, difficulties with cognition, with sleep, circadian rhythm, uh, so-called brain fog, which is such a complicated matter. Um, 
it, it just, to me, the, the role of neuroinflammation is so important. And uh, until told otherwise, my presumption is it exists and is a part of the etiology here. And we have wonderful tools for this, uh, both in, uh, in the area of uh, MR and MR imaging, as well as uh, positron emission tomography, uh, developing these molecules to image and identify these uh, findings. So it just makes sense for us to pay attention to this and use many of the things that we have already fully developed for dementias, for Parkinson's, for ALS, for uh, so many other neurological diseases. To, uh, and we have uh, wonderful colleagues here who have been following patients with ME for decades. And it just makes sense for us to explore these possibilities um, with uh, so many of our imaging individuals, the imaging colleagues, and our neuroscientists. We have a huge neuro uh, group that, uh, I, that we've gotten to be very interested in the topic. Yeah, I mean, I imagine, I mean, obviously without all that expertise, you can see that there's a, a, a fantastic kind of, uh, I think there's probably a, a fantastic resource there, but also um, it may lead to kind of interesting treatments um, and repurposing of treatments, I guess, for MECFS, if you can find some commonalities there between different neuroinflammation parts. Um, yeah. There's many, many companies here that are, that are very interested in very expensive monoclonals uh, against very um, uh, so many targets, but there there are also a number of companies here in ALS and for that matter in in other in other neuroinflammatory diseases like dementia, uh, repurposing drugs um, that are um, anti-inflammatory. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, that's these oh. safe that should have very. Uh, relevant effects, uh, reduction of neural inflammation, but they're safe and not overly expensive. But of course, we are going to have those with those. Uh, we have many companies here that are interested in the expensive drugs. <laughs> but uh, it also, uh, there are many technologies and opportunities developed because those companies are interested in the expensive drugs. So I, I think there's a good interplay and opportunity. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be fascinating. I mean, I think we've covered a lot of major topics in the, in the world of MECFS. We're talking uh, etiology, your projects and diagnosis, and maybe even looking towards treatment avenues towards the end. Um, I think, obviously, you're doing a lot of fantastic work there at MGH and uh, Harvard Associated Hospitals. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for coming and giving an update. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think people will be very interested to, to kind of hear more at some point in the future. Sounds great. Thanks, Ron.